It is now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Professor Yarin Dudai, uh, who is joining us online. Professor Dudai is uh, Emeritus Professor uh, of uh, Neurobiology at the uh, Weizmann Institute of Science and uh, Vilna Family Global Distinguished Professor of Neuroscience at uh, New York University. He is a leading figure in the study of the uh, neurogenetics uh, of human memory. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Yadin Duday. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I wish to start by extending my thanks uh, to the organizers and uh, regretting that I cannot attend uh, uh, on site. Uh, I very much appreciate the initiative and I learned a lot while uh, preparing for uh, um, following the Kyoto Kokoro uh, initiative um, and I hope uh, to see you all uh, uh, at the earliest uh, when we get rid of this uh, limit situation in uh, which we are now. Uh, without further ado, I will uh, start uh, my talk, uh, which is entitled The uh, Portable Homeland how crisis-induced insight had rescued Jewish cultural memory from oblivion. Uh, I will, of course, explain uh, throughout the talk uh, some notions that I present, and uh, I understand that there will be time for questions and uh, for uh, clarifications if required. So the, here is the outline of uh, my talk. A, what is cultural memory? How is cultural memory retained over generations? How can cultural memory counteract collective crisis that may lead to cultural amnesia, generic solutions, example from ancient Jewish culture, and a note on our time? What is cultural memory? So the collective memory of a group of people that share a set of narratives about their group's identity and origin, traditions and customs, this is the definition, it is stored in the concerted activity of a distributed system of brains and artifacts, not only in brains as biological memory. We need the artifacts to overcome the uh, limit on the time, on the, on the lifespan of an individual. And it can persist because of that for hundreds and thousands of years. That in memory systems in general, of different types and levels, the output is the results of collective activity of multiple components. It's not only that collective memory or cultural memory is the outcome of concerted activity of multiple components. In a physiological level, it's, for example, the collective activity of molecules or of circuits in the brain. Individual's behavior is the collective activity of parts of the brain. Collective behavior, like collective memory, is the collective concerted activity of individuals in society aided by the artifacts, for example, cultural memory, that we will discuss how this type of memory persists over time, including in collective limit situations. So what are the instruments that store collective or cultural memory? I will use the terminology collective and cultural memory from now on interchangeably. I'll make the difference, I'll know the difference only when it is essential. So we can treat collective memory and cultural memory once we define cultural memory as the same. So first of all, <clears throat> the memory is encoded in engrams in individual brains, which we, engrams means memory, and engram means memory trace. So memory, memory traces in individual brains are necessary, but those are not memory uh, traces in an individual brain that persists only for the lifespan of that individual. It persists also over generations, and we'll see how. Corporal marks, language, oral transmission, images, texts, art, places and shared territory, monuments, cultural customs and ceremonies. So in addition to the memory in the individual brain, individual memory, we have artifacts that together with the brains store, retain, express 
the collective and cultural memory. I wish to present, to, to, to turn your attention to three items here to which we will return in the course of this presentation. Texts, places and shared territory, and cultural customs and ceremonies. We will understand the meaning, why do I, the, the, the meaning of these uh, instruments in the context of our current discussion, and why is it that I emphasize them in a few minutes. How long does cultural memory persist? Well, evidence suggests that it may decay within three generations, unless measures are taken to keep it going for longer periods. I don't have time to go into this evidence. I just wish to turn your attention to the fact or to the observation, which is intuitive, that if you have more than three generations, then the individual that experienced the event is not with us anymore after three or four generations. So if you wish to have a rule of thumb to the persistence of cultural memory in a society without spatial uh, instruments to keep it going further, you may think about it as the memory that goes from the grandfather to the grandchild. This is the length of the memory within three generations, unless measures are taken to keep it for longer periods. And just as a brief example, without going into details, an example of recent big data analysis done the, by the group of Candia et al. and published in Nature, Human Behavior in 2019. And I should say here that I'll be very happy to provide you with references to provide the audience. Whoever is interested, please contact me by email. I'll be happy to provide you with references to uh, some conclusions that I make here. Here is an example of recent big data analysis. We don't have to go into this analysis. The only thing we have to note here as an example, this is the, if you follow the red line, which is a model based on data, you see that the cultural memory that is here measured online by citations of papers, by patents, by music, via Spotify, by movies, via trailers in YouTube, by biographies, via uh, wiki pages, view, and so on and so on. The accessibility of this memory declines within less than three generations. The half-life is about one generation, unless measures are taken to keep it going farther. In reality, cultural memory can remain viable for thousands of years. So measures are taken to keep it persistent for a very long period. Here is an example, cultural memory of the contemporary Jewish population. This is one population studied in Israel in which the experiment involved free recall. People were asked to recall without any cue 10 items that they consider as important, as critical in keeping the cultural memory of the Jewish population going over time. And this is what we get. This is the items recalled number, which is, this is the frequency of recall. This is the time of the assumed or actual. We are talking here about a combination of fact and fiction. It doesn't matter for cultural memory for the purpose of this discussion, whether it was a fact or whether this is a fictional fact. Time of assumed or actual item recalled. For many of these, there is evidence for the fact. For some of them, it's a myth that has yet to be proven or is proven to be more complex than a fact. So this is minus 14th century BC. This is first century AD, and this is the present. And you see that people re recall items which are not homogeneous. They recall peaks, for example, the core memory of the nation. I'll refer to it in a minute. Now, periods or events that occurred over time, for example, the Kingdom of Israel, the destruction of the Temple, the Spanish expulsion and acquisition in the 15th uh, century, at the end of the 15th century, pogroms in the 19th and 20th, 20th century, Holocaust, which is the major trauma of the Jewish population in the 20th century, and some recency effects, which are over the past three generations or more. So let's refer for a minute to the meaning of core memory. What is core memory? 
core cultural or national memory is the elemental set of cross-generational memory items that is considered by the members of the culture or of the nation, if you refer to a nation instead of a culture, sometimes it's very similar, but it's obviously not the same, to define their own origin and its uniqueness. Related notions in the context of cultural national memory, uh, for those of you who are from other disciplines, for example, peace echoes origin myth in anthropology and history, self-narrative in developmental psychology, mise en abime in literature, theater and cinema, and credo, which is the core belief in religious studies. The core origin memory of the Jewish people <clears throat> that people remember so well uh, at least 2,500 years later, uh, was committed in writing, committed to writing in only 63 Hebrew words over 2,300 years ago. And it can be broken down into five terse statements. We don't have to remember this. I just bring it up in order to show that it's a very terse statement. A, a wandering Aramean was my ancestor, B, he went down into Egypt and lived there as an alien. Three, the Egyptians treated us harshly. We cried to Yova, the god of our ancestors. Four, Yova brought us out of Egypt with a terrifying display of power, science, and wonders. And five, he brought us and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. This is the charter myth. Altogether is the core origin myth of the Jewish population, which was written as a piece of history in only 60, 63 Hebrew words uh, already 2,300 years ago, and maybe even more. By the way, if we translate it into other languages, it's much longer. For example, in English, it's twice the length, which means that Hebrew was a language which was very, which had the very terse um, uh, formulations for putting things on writing. And at first, for about 30, 40 generations, it was carried on by oral transmissions from the 13th, 11th century BCE to the 7th or 3rd century BCE. We are not sure, the archaeologists and the historians are not sure about the exact dates, and it's not critical for our purpose now. But then later on, from the 6th to 4th century BCE, somewhere in between when it was put in writing, for over 100 generations since, it's committed to a written text. And the text you can find easily in the Deuteronomy, in the, this is the place, and again, I can, I'm happy to present it to you if you wish, if you approach me by email or if you look at the Bible. So for about 100 generations, this is committed to a written text, but it's actually committed to cultural memory, which is recalled by heart until present time. How was a viable core memory retained for so long? So there were three items here that I wish to turn your attention to. One is uh, not so important for our discussion, but I still wish to make it clear. Mnemonic aids, instruments that assist memory, were implemented in the text from its outset, like alliteration, like poetic parallelism, easily remembered numbers and acronyms, and so on and so on. This means that from the beginning, from the outset, when it was put in writing, the editor or the author of this text, of this historical core uh, myth, intended it to be remembered because mnemonic aids were implanted in the text from the outset. We will not talk about it any further. Recurrent procedural reactivations were implanted to convert it from remote cultural memory, which is over several thousand years, to a much shorter personal memory, which lasts for from a day to a year by reenactment that overcomes temporal construal distance. I'll explain that in a minute. From the outset, by religious law, every adult in the population had to recite this text at least once by heart. It was later incorporated into the Passover Haggadah, read annually with the explicit instruction to personally reenact the ancient experience. I'll return again and again to this issue of personally reenacting a memory. 
This is critical for the model. This is critical for the algorithm and we'll come back to it. And further, by leaving the name of that pharaoh, which we had as the tyrant that uh, has driven uh, the, the Jewish population to slavery in Egypt, the memory uh, of that oppression extend to all who had felt the oppression of a tyrant on any time because the name was left blank, although it was clearly easy to put it there, at least in contemporary episodic reenactment. So again, we see here an attempt to induce, to incite, to invoke, personally reenacting the ancient experience, which is carried out in a text, but to experience it personally and to feel like it happened to you. So this is the critical point here in the instrument that retains this memory for so long. We, uh, if we go farther into this kind of studies, we can propose an algorithm, a set of steps for the maintenance of long-term cultural memory in general. This is a gener generic algorithm. Let's walk through it. There is an event or there is a piece of information which represents the event. And that event, which occurs at a certain point in time, can be either forgotten, and then we forget about it, or remembered. We'll confine our remarks to the event if it is remembered. If it is an event, it, is, it starts as an episodic memory because it's an experience. If it's not an event, if it's just a text, or something you hear about, it's a semantic memory. But in any way, episodic memory of our personal experiences is always converted into semantic memory. This goes into the processes or mechanisms of memory in the brain. And episodic memory is always converted in, over time into semantic memory. This is done by processes which are called consolidation or reconsolidation once it had been consolidated we don't have time to go into them. The, on, the only thing we have to remember to note here, there is a process of maturation of the memory of the experience into semantic memory. So whatever happens, the information about an event over time, even in individual experience is converted into semantic memory. Memory that is expressed in a semantic terms and does not involve the viability of the experience and does not involve the issues of exactly when the event happened, but it is, event, it is a piece of memory, an item in memory that refers to how and where. When we remember events in our life, very often we remember them as semantic pieces of information. And then this can reconsolidate, remature every time we retrieve it, and then semantic memory again, and so on and so on. It can get, go on for the length of a life span of an individual, or if it is in cultural memory, much longer. But what can keep it from one generation to another? So here is the trick of that algorithm. Whatever happens, you introduce a procedural or procedure into the memory. Procedural memory means that you have to perform some acts based on either culture or other instructions that will bring the memory back. For example, cultural routines, memorial days, holidays, in any culture, in every culture, you have memorial days, you have cultural routines, you have holidays. Those are procedures that are introduced by the culture in order for you to recollect events that are either semantic memory or even convert them into episodic memory. How do you convert them into episodic memory? You introduce into the procedure elements that cause you to think that you are part of the population or of the event that occurred long ago. You reenact the event. This ability to reenact an event by instructions like thinking, 
Please think that you yourself was driven out of Egypt. Please think, for example, in another culture that you yourself were uh, involved in the victory over X or Y. This is a mnemonic booster because reenacting, reenacting an event and converting it for a while into episodic memory boosts the strength of the memory and reinforces this cycle again and again. So the algorithm for maintenance long-term culture, cultural memory involves not only the routine conversion of episodic into semantic memory, but also the introduction by the culture of procedures that will incite in every individual, in every generation, a mnemonic booster that will reinforces the memory farther and farther over more and more generations. This is the role of cultural routines. This is one of the roles of cultural routines. This is the role of the Memorial Days. This is the role of holidays. One of the roles, not only one, but a very important one for the persistence of cultural memory. So Jewish cultural memory is dominated by collective traumas. Even the core memory involves a trauma, being slaves in Egypt. But please note all the other items that are recalled spontaneously in free recall by members of the culture now in the 21st century. By the way, a very similar memory curve is obtained if instead of Israeli participants, you uh, do the same test on Jewish participants from the United States. It's very similar. There are some changes in the magnitude, but it's very similar. So the core memory, the destruction of the temple, destruction of the temple, Spanish expulsion programs, and of course the Holocaust, they are all, they are all very severe trauma. <clears throat> they are very severe traumas. The effect of, of trauma, I apologize for this typo, a, on subsequent cultural memory is double-edged. The effect of trauma on subsequent cultural memory is double-edged. Itself, trauma is a salient stimulus for long-term memory. This is exactly what we see in the memory curve, in the cultural memory curve. But trauma itself can affect other items in cultural memory. It can do it by two means. Why? It has a limited effect. It can interfere with the subsequent memory of other events. For example, it can interfere with events that occurred before the trauma by overshadowing them. So if you have a very severe trauma, it may overshadow events that occur before the trauma. This is retroactive interference with subsequent memory for other events. And you can think yourself about other items in other examples in personal life or in cultural life. It has also a general effect. It affects global instruments that keep cultural memory going. You remember we had a number of instruments that keep the memory going. One of them is the brain itself, but we had many artifacts, artifactual instruments. Notably, exile, which is part of the major traumas in Jewish cultural memory, eliminates the contribution of a territorial homeland to the persistence of collective or cultural memory. If you recall, the homeland is one of the major binding elements for a culture. The destruction of the first temple involved an exile from the homeland. The destruction of the second temple in the first century AD culminated in a very major destruction of the homeland and a very massive exile. So the particularly traumatic and critical event was this one here, the destruction of the second temple in the first century, where the people of the Jewish people of Israel were driven out of their homeland and the homeland was practically destroyed. I'm not going to go into the details and the uh, reservations about this total destruction, but we can take it for the purpose of discussion as a major destruction of the homeland. The second exile in the first or second century 
um, CE was the most traumatic. So the first exile is illustrated by the green broken arrow here. It was a small one, relatively small one, from the land of Israel to uh, uh, Babylonia. It's here. But the second one, which is illustrated here by the red lines, involved the expulsion of the people of Israel from their land to the diaspora. It was a major one. And this is the major exile that created the Jewish diaspora since then for over 2,000 years. As you remember, there were multiple instruments that keep cultural memory going. But the exile and the destruction of the homeland destroyed this one. Places and shared territory were no longer available, which involves also the elimination of monuments, which involves also the destruction, disintegration of cultural customs and ceremonies. What were the rem remedies invented to ameliorate the damaging effect of exile on subsequent cultural memory and to compensate for the loss of that ancient homeland? There were multiple remedies. One of them, which is here in gray, is not our concern now. It was the replacing of the destroyed temple with local synagogues and ritual sacrifices with prayers. We're not going to refer to it. But the major one was the replacing of the whole one. And the, from my point of view, the ingenious one was the replacing of the homeland with a virtual homeland, actualized in a rich textual corpus, which culminated the Talmud. I'll explain what the Talmud is for a, in a minute, that interprets and debates the laws and the custom of the land as if its routines continue, although the physical land is no more available. So the physical homeland was replaced over time with a virtual homeland, or if you wish, with a portable homeland, because it's a text. You can carry it to wherever you are. The Talmud became the virtual portable homeland, replacing an independent of a geographical homeland. The Talmud is uh, the central text of Jewish law, comprising of the Mishnah, and which was uh, uh, edited until uh, about 200 uh, AD, and the Gemara, which was uh, edited until about 500 uh, AD, and the standard print is about uh, 2,700 two-sided folio pages. There is a classical uh, structure to it. It looks like this. This is one page. It's in a homonautic text. This is the core text, and then there are interpretations on the side. And we, of course, will not be going into it, but I just wanted to bring a graphic demonstration. Mishnah is the first major written collection of the Jewish oral traditions. It's here in the text in the beginning. Gemara is the elucidation of the Mishnah that ventures into subjects related to conduct in all aspects of life. It contains also legends. It contains some stories. It contains debates. But the major role is to venture into subjects that relate to conduct in all aspects of life as though the physical land is still available, although it's unavailable. And indeed, until the advent of modernity, until rather recently, in nearly all Jewish communities, the Talmud was the centerpiece of Jewish cultural life all over the diaspora. And it doesn't matter whether there, were only, there was only a Jewish population of 10 people or a Jewish population of 1,000 people or a Jewish population of 100,000 people at a certain location. In these places, until the advent of modernity, modernity in all these communities, the Talmud was the centerpiece of Jewish cultural life, and indeed, it served as the guide for the daily life, the unifying force of the diaspora, and the portable homeland of the Jewish people. This is a terminology I borrow from Boyarin from an excellent book in 2015. But the notion that it was a portable homeland of the Jewish people is a, it came before a, by and, and, and was expressed by several scholars over time. So we replaced here the physical homeland with a, a virtual one. 
<clears throat> However, the text is not enough. It has to remain alive and used routinely, <clears throat> sorry, by individuals throughout life. It has to be reactivated on a regular basis and involve, in addition to the semantic reactivation, routines that trigger individual epidotic experience each generation new. You remember the algorithm? The algorithm required, required that we'll have routines that will render semantic memory into episodes. We should feel that we are experiencing, our, experiencing it ourselves at the moment of recall. This is a booster. And the prerequisite for all this, and it is very important to note, that already in the first century CE around the destruction of the land and the exile, the major exile, which in fact occurred until the second century CE, a religious ordinance was issued requiring all Jewish fathers, well, it doesn't matter whether rich or poor, doesn't matter what they do, what the profession is, to teach their sons from the age of six or seven to read and study scriptures in Hebrew. This is critical because if you have that, on the basis of that, you can have a text as a virtual homeland, as a portable homeland, because you ensure that people can read it, can comprehend it, can recite it, can remember it, can recall it. So to appreciate the solution, we should recall the instrument that store collective and cultural memory. We remember them all. I emphasized in gray the individual brain, but the most important one for our the ones for our discussion are these that we group together under artifacts. Places and shared territory, the homeland was destroyed. The virtual homeland was invented and converted into a text. And cultural customs and ceremonies were the tools that created the impression that life goes on. Although there was geographical homeland which binds the people, the culture together, disappears, is destroyed. And what we have is the virtual homeland that the cultural custom and ceremony keeps persistent, keeps going, and creates the impression that the homeland some homeland, which is a portable one, doesn't matter where you are because it's a text, it's a virtual one, still goes on. So a reminder, schematic algorithm for the maintenance of long-term cultural memory. We have a semantic or episodic information, which is converted into semantic memory, whether in the individual or in the collective. Then you introduce a procedure, procedural memory. For example, a recurrent reactivations by cultural routines, holidays, festives, and study cycles of text, e.g. the portable homeland. According to Jewish tradition, you have to study the text every year and new. There are cycles, whether there are cycles of a year, whether the annual cycles, whether there are cycles of four years, it doesn't matter for our purpose, there are cycles. It will go on forever in the culture. So this is time, transgenerational uh, time, and this converts the semantic memory into a reminder. And if successful, the procedure will reenact an individual episodic memory and both will boost the, coll the collective memory further and et cetera, et cetera. So the mnemonic booster is an invention which is extremely important under these conditions. So the take home message. An effective generic algorithm for maintaining cultural memory over hundreds and thousands of years involves procedures as mnemonic boosters that reenact episodically the collective memory in individuals, each generation, and you. Limit situations can have a double-edged effect on cultural memory, like trauma. They are themselves etched in memory. They are very strong memory items, but they can also affect other collective memories. For example, by overshadowing other collective memories or by destroying, by eliminating some instruments that are required for keeping the collective memory going. The effect of other memory may be global in cases in which a significant binding element of the collective memory is eliminated. For example, when the trauma is the destruction of the homeland and exile, like in the 
example that I gave. The trauma of exile led Jewish culture to invent a portable homeland, the Talmud, which is integrated into reactivating procedures that were successful in keeping the cultural memory going for many generations in the diaspora. And last, just a note about contemporary limit situations, for example, the COVID-19 pandemic. The reason why I cannot be physically now, unfortunately, in Kyoto is this limit situation. A, it will be retained in collective memory as trauma. It doesn't matter whether it will last for another month or another half a year, or another year, or lo and behold, for, other, for another two years, I hope not. It will be retained in collective memory of the human culture as a trauma, like, for example, the Spanish flu in, uh, uh, that occurred in 1917 to 1921. But it will also enhance a global virtual, virtual portable homeland space. For example, the replacement of many meetings by Zoom meetings like this one and by social networks. So in fact, we are now experiencing, we are now participating in a virtual portable homeland because we are not in the same place. We are sharing the same cultural space. This may have two types of outcome. A, Enhancement of global culture, independent of the conventional culture, national origin myth, which is also something that happens by globalization anyway. But this type of limit situation might enhance this globalization uh, trend. And retention of classic cultures independent of the shared territory, with only the core memory of the original culture retained. And this is exactly the invention of the Jewish culture in the first century, in the second century, first and second century AD. It might not be unique to the Jewish culture, but it was very successful in keeping a viable Jewish culture over many generations just by keeping various procedures, including the ability to refer, to center the life around a virtual portable homeland. Thank you for your attention.